Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you very much uh, for uh, having me here. Um, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, I apologize that uh, Dr. Bryant could not be here. Um, but uh, uh, the two of us kind of speak the same, same language as far as the management of uh, ovarian cancer is concerned. We were trained by some of the same people, and we kind of believe uh, in the same philosophy of doing the best for our patients. And so um, I will hope to uh, fill in um, his place. Um, so a little bit about me, um, as Deandra mentioned, um, I uh, was born in India, did my medical school in India, and uh, did uh, part of my surgical training at the Royal College of Surgeons in England uh, before coming here. Um, when I was doing residency at Wayne State University, Detroit, uh, Dr. Chris Bryant was uh, my fellow. Um, and so uh, he was four years senior than me. But um, due to my interest in G1 oncology, we uh, developed good uh, friendship and uh, that continues to this day. After graduating um, at Wayne State, Dr. Bryant went to MD Anderson. Um, I went to uh, Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota, and that's where I did my fellowship. But um, our friendship continues, and uh, right now we are colleagues. I joined the Baptist Cancer Center in Memphis. Um, so we do a lot of uh, work together. We work very collaboratively. Um, even though he might be uh, seeing a patient here, but uh, in the background we are doing a lot of discussions. Um, when we don't know the answer to certain problems, uh, we are always quick to call our friends um, at Mayo Clinic or his connections uh, at MD Anderson Cancer Center. So don't think that you know, you're alone. Um, we have the capability and the connections to get the best resources out there to help you uh, in the situations where we don't know what to do. Um, so please seek us out. Um, we would love to help you uh, in whatever way that we can. Um, now, I'm going to talk uh, briefly about the ovarian cancer, um, the way it presents and what should be done. Uh, that's the area of our expertise. Um, this is going to be very informal, so if any, of, any one of you has any personal experience or if you want to share a story, uh, please feel free to do so because uh, personal experience is the best teacher and um, others can learn a lot from that as well. So after this uh, introduction, Um, the picture up there is uh, that of the ovary, and uh, so this is the ovary. It is usually suspended uh, by uh, this bigger organ, which is the uterus, and this is the fallopian tube. Now, when we say ovarian cancer, we are actually talking about a lot of uh, diseases combined. What appears to be ovarian cancer, in fact, can come from this fallopian tube, this ovary, or the lining of the abdominal wall. So oftentimes when people say ovarian cancer, we may be dealing with um, uh, a slightly different disease, which is right now treated in a similar way. But in future, as we are finding more and more about these diseases, especially about their biology, their treatments might differ in future, but right now everything is treated the same way. So, a little bit about the appearance of the ovary. This is how the normal ovary will, will look like. And the cancer most commonly grows on the ovary, or as I mentioned, it may grow on the fallopian tube or the covering of the abdominal wall which will be the surrounding area. How common is ovarian cancer? Fortunately, it is not very common. One in 71 women in the United States uh, will be diagnosed with ovarian cancer, which is very good because this disease, uh, we, we have a lot to achieve in terms of management of this disease because it still carries a fair bit of morbidity 
or uh, illness or uh, deaths associated with it. Now, not everyone um, has a similar risk of getting ovarian cancer. And the list up there will tell us that there are some people who are more inclined to get ovarian cancer than the other uh, patients. As you age, as the age increases, the risk of um, getting any kind of cancer increases, in fact. And ovarian cancer is no different. As we age, um, something happens with our genetics that we are more prone to get uh, cancer. Early menarche or late menopause is that the duration of having menstrual periods in, in general. The longer is that duration, a little bit higher is the risk of getting cancer. Then if you haven't had kids, your risk is a little bit higher than the rest of the population. The increase in risk is not very large, but still you are at a large at a higher risk or a larger risk. Family history is a big one. So if you have history of breast cancer, uh, either a personal history of breast cancer or um, there is someone in your family, um, in your cousins, uh, on your father's side or mother's side, if they have uh, either breast or ovarian cancer, then you are at a slightly higher risk of getting ovarian cancer. And you should always keep that in mind. Whenever you meet, uh, meet your doctor, you should bring that up. Because there are some genetic disorders out there, mainly related to the BRCA genes or the breast cancer associated genes, um, that give you a very, very high risk of ovarian cancer if they are present. If that's the situation, you want to bring it out uh, early rather than later uh, to your doctor. Because a lot of the times, we can remove the ovaries, and that reduces your risk of getting ovarian cancer drastically in a big way. So if someone to ask me, um, if someone was to ask me uh, if we can do anything to prevent ovarian cancer, this is as close as we can get is that this is the group of women where we can help them a great deal. Before they develop ovarian cancer, if we remove their fallopian tubes and ovaries, uh, that's a huge preventative step. But that is right now applicable to women who have uh, a very uh, strong family history of ovarian or breast cancers or who have a diagnosis of a BRCA mutation. So if you were to take one thing out of this talk today, just remember the, the BRCA mutations, uh, strong family history, do not forget to bring that out to your doctor because that's where we can really help. Other uh, conditions that are associated are some infections in the pelvis or taking hormone replacement therapy for a long time. It's okay if you take it for a short amount of time, such as, you know, a few years, but if you have been taking that uh, hormonal replacement therapy for 10 to 20 years, then you want to bring that up. Now, the good news is that um, having multiple children using oral contraceptive pills or breastfeeding have been traditionally associated with a decreased risk of ovarian cancer. So that's good news. Now, as I mentioned, uh, the BRCA genes and the BRCA mutations, as is evident from this chart, if you have a BRCA mutation, your risk of ovarian cancer by age of 70 is almost half, one-fourth to one-half, as compared to only less than 2% in general population. So you can see that the, the, the risk of ovarian cancer increases tremendously if you have a BRCA mutation. Not only ovarian cancer, if your chances of increasing, um, having the breast cancer increases um, if you have BRCA mutations as well. So for multiple reasons, it's important to look at the family history um, and to report that to your doctor. 
Now, what are the, some of the s s uh, symptoms that people can develop if they have ovarian cancer? Now, traditionally we say that um, ovarian cancer is kind of a silent disease. In the majority of women, uh, it is not diagnosed at a very, very early stage. And the reason is because there are no specific symptoms for ovarian cancer. Because it has a lot of space to grow in, and I'll show you, show you a picture uh, a little bit later, um, it is not uncommon for us to see that uh, the ovarian cancer would have had a lot of time to grow in the belly. And it is not until very late that people think that, you know, my, my abdomen is getting very, very large. I've accumulated some fluid in the abdomen, and that's the stage at which they seek out help. The idea is to try and recognize some of the symptoms which are fairly nonspecific, but to report them to the doctor early. And uh, if you get to us early, then we can help you in, in a much better way as compared to if the cancer uh, would have already spread at multiple other sites, then um, the situation kind of becomes uh, bad. So these are the symptoms that we should watch out for, which is non-specific bloating, pelvic or abdominal pain, difficulty eating, or feeling fill, full too quickly, and uh, some urinary urgency. Um, as you can see, these are fairly non-specific. A lot of people have them, and they don't have ovarian cancer. I don't want to scare anyone away. Um, but if all of them are present, then you want to be real careful. You want to seek out help with a family doctor or a GYN oncologist, um, because sometimes we can you know, do a quick ultrasound of the abdomen, do a, a couple of blood tests, and find out if there's anything sinister that is going on in the belly. So the idea um, of one of the uh, main ideas of the awareness campaigns is to watch out for the exact symptoms, the bloating, eating less abdominal pain, trouble with the bladder, and to report them um, as quickly as possible. Uh, after having uh, some experience, uh, roughly, um, of seven years of uh, interacting with patients with ovarian cancer, uh, one of the most common stories that they would tell, tell me was, is that, you know, I thought that I was gaining weight and I was having this non-specific um, problem of, you know, bloating. I couldn't eat uh, as much as I could earlier. Uh, surprisingly, though, I, I tried to lose weight, tried to do some exercise, some swimming, um, I noted that I was eating less, and I was overall losing weight, but the size of my belly would still stay the same. And so initially I thought that, you know, maybe I was just not losing weight uh, from my belly. Um, but eventually over the time I realized that, you know, the belly is staying either the same or getting larger, whereas rest of the my, rest of my body is losing weight. This is a very, very common mode of presentation and the story that we get. And the idea is to get, get to the doctor uh, earlier, earlier than this situation develops. So remember uh, these uh, kind of non-specific symptoms. Now, ovarian cancer has a lot of space uh, that it can grow in, and that is why it doesn't present earlier. It presents late. So these are some of the areas uh, this is the liver where it can grow up. Uh, this is kind of the stomach where it can grow up. Uh, the omentum is the fatty covering of the intestines uh, where ovarian cancer can grow up. And a lot of the times we'll see a lot of disease uh, in the pelvis, on the uterus, uh, on the ovaries itself. But uh, the, the abdominal wall is kind of a uh, very apt organ for this cancer to grow. Uh, if, for example, if you have a bone cancer, you will see a lump very quickly. If you have an endometrial cancer, it will present with some vaginal bleeding, and then again, it kind of forces the person to seek out help. But since this cancer has a lot of space to grow in, it does not uh, make itself uh, visible, which is uh, 
notorious for this kind of disease. Again, this chart displays how the late diagnosis is a key factor in why a lot of people who get diagnosed with ovarian cancer, they don't do that well. They don't, don't do as well as we would like them to do. If you look at the five-year survival of ovarian cancer, um, it is not very good. And this is one of the main reasons why it is not good is majority of women are at this stage that the cancer would have already spread at distant sites. If you had a personal experience with ovarian cancer and it was not, uh, it, it was not diagnosed at uh, other sites, consider yourself very lucky because that is where we want to catch it as when it uh, should not have grown outside. So after talking about um, how ovarian cancer grows and what are some of the known, um, known specific symptoms, let's talk a little bit about how we uh, should treat ovarian cancer if we diagnose it. And uh, right now there are two common approaches of ovarian cancer treatment. Um, traditionally, in, in the United States, we treat it very aggressively, which we believe is the right way to treat it. Um, we do a fairly radical uh, surgical operation to remove all the cancer wherever we can find it uh, within the abdomen. Whichever organ um, gets ovarian cancer or gets the ovarian cancer growth, we remove it. And uh, that is by far right now the most certain way of getting rid of the cancer. And that involves upfront surgery, as is presented right here, followed by six cycles of chemotherapy. And the chemotherapy can be given by the IV route or it can be given directly in the belly. Uh, and, and we call that as an intraperitoneal route. Now, another approach has become popular mainly in Europe nowadays, which is they don't do surgery upfront, but they do chemotherapy upfront. Then they do surgery, then they do some more chemotherapy. And if we compare how long uh, their patients survive um, as compared to how long our patients survive in the States, usually we fare much better. So um, we do about 30% better in terms of survival. And that's why um, in the United States and in a lot of other countries where uh, the healthcare is kind of uh, on the aggressive side, uh, where, there, where it is based on, you know, based on the patients, um, you'll have this approach. And uh, this is the right way to go based on the numbers. In, in a lot of the countries where they have socialized system of medicine where uh, you kind of get uh, a, a rationed approach to the healthcare. Um, you'll get chemotherapy and then um, abbreviated surgery and then followed by chemotherapy. Now, having said that, we advocate this kind of treatment. Having said that, sometimes um, the health of the person who got ovarian cancer is not very good uh, because of the cancer, because they may have multiple other medical problems. And they may not be the best candidates to tolerate a big operation. And if that is the situation, then we go for this approach first and then followed by um, our uh, standard surgery. Because once we give a little bit of chemotherapy, that gives um, the person a chance to build up strength. And uh, they are in, then in a better position to tolerate a bigger operation which then becomes the definitive cancer operation. But again, um, radical surgery followed by chemotherapy is the way to go. Now this picture shows uh, briefly how one of the other approaches of chemotherapy uh, is conducted. In this approach, we do chemotherapy directly in the abdomen. So the infusion bag hangs over there and uh, gets chemotherapy directly in the abdomen. And, and the idea is to get chemotherapy directly over the cancer where it is growing. Some of the chemotherapy is also absorbed from these surfaces into the blood, and that circulates the chemotherapy 
um, elsewhere in the body as well. But this is, again, um, a relatively uh, very intensive way to do chemotherapy. And not many people may be able to tolerate it. It, it carries higher toxicity rate, um, but again, it gives slightly better results. So if you were to seek care with Dr. Bryant or someone like me uh, who are uh, the people who are well-trained in GI oncology, we will decide with you as to what is the best way to do it. Because if, if your body is frail, if it's not apt to uh, tolerating a lot of side effects, then we don't want to do that. Then we want to do the traditional uh, intravenous route of chemotherapy. But if you're strong, you feel good, you, you have ready access to uh, healthcare providers, then doing intraperitoneal chemotherapy uh, may, be a, may be a good idea. So because uh, it is so important to seek the right provider um, who have expertise in management of uh, these kind of cancers, um, our society, our national society, the Society of Gynecologic Oncologists put out some guidelines that even if you don't have ovarian cancer, but if there's something that could look like ovarian cancer in future, you should seek uh, a care from a G1 oncologist. You should talk to your doctor um, that if any of these things are present, for example, if there's some omental caking, which is omentum is a fatty covering of the intestines, and if you get a CT scan and it shows that you know, there are some areas uh, which are thickened out, uh, you should definitely talk to your doctor about uh, getting maybe a second opinion or another uh, you know, pair of hands or eyes um, to find out if this is ovarian cancer. Some of the other things that, you know, if you have a pelvic mass which is larger than 10 centimeter, if both of the ovaries contain two masses, like usually one ovary presents with one mass, but if there are uh, growths on both the ovaries, that, that again is a very, very high, um, very uh, suspicious situation for getting uh, ovarian cancer. Some of the other things is CA125 is, is a tumor marker that we commonly order, and you can ask your doctor to order the test for you if the uh, pathology that is suspected may be ovarian cancer. And sometimes it helps us in deciding uh, for referrals and uh, for deciding whether the mass is benign or uh, actual cancer. A lot of the times, the CA125 may, level may be abnormal, and you may just be fine, but uh, you want to get that checked out because the outlook is uh, not very good if the diagnosis is uh, ovarian cancer, and certainly you don't want to leave any stone unturned. So um, the most important modality, as I mentioned, is uh, ovarian cancer surgery. And you absolutely want to make sure that you get the state-of-the-art ovarian cancer surgery. That uh, the state-of-the-art ovarian cancer surgery is wherever there's a tumor nodule, uh, there's real big emphasis in taking it out. It, it is very time-consuming. Sometimes the surgeries may last as long as 10 hours, 12 hours. Uh, but you want, want to make sure that uh, uh, genuine effort is made to remove every tumor nodule that was there. Because that is when you have the best shot at survival, survival for a long time. And uh, there are three people uh, right now who have shaped uh, the debate in ovarian cancer surgery. Um, Dr. William Clybe, he practices uh, at the Mayo Clinic, Rochester, Minnesota. Dr. Denise Chi uh, is in practice at the Memorial Sloan Catering uh, Cancer Center. Uh, in New York, and uh, Dr. Uh, Rob Bristow. He uh, was at John Hopkins previously, but right now is in California. And uh, they have studied ovarian cancer surgery over the years and have put out some uh, good papers. And uh, I was fortunate enough um, to be trained by one of them, Dr. Uh, Bill Clyby, who remains a good friend and is a mentor. Uh, also in the picture are 
um, his wife, Victoria, and my wife, um, Sumeda, who also joined the Baptist Medical Group um, in Memphis. Just wanted to show this picture to you um, to display that even though we might be here, but we are very closely connected to national and international experts. And if there's a situation uh, in which we cannot deal with it, or we just need another opinion, um, we are talking to the right people for you. That may not be right in front of you. Maybe after seeing you, we, we are making a phone call or reviewing your case. But uh, our emphasis is absolutely to get you the best care possible. Um, also wanted to point out one of the um, art journal articles that uh, Dr. Bristow actually published uh, in the New York Times, which was very uh, well received and was very widely read um, amongst politicians, policymakers, and stuff like that. Um, he pointed out um, with fairly rigorous studies that uh, nationwide, only about a third to half of the women are actually getting the state-of-the-art care when they get diagnosed with ovarian cancer. And that just highlights the uh, scope of the problem, is that a lot of people are getting operated uh, in suboptimal conditions. And our idea of giving this message out is uh, just to make sure that we tell you that if there's anything suspicious, if you get a diagnosis, uh, it is unfortunate, but it is important to do your research and important to seek out the right kind of experts who have experience in management of this disease. It's, it's not like many other illnesses where it does not matter who is your care provider, but it is the kind of disease where the quality of care that you get is absolutely paramount. You will live longer if a well-trained person does your operation if you get the right kind of chemotherapy, and if you complete your treatment. And so seeking expert help um, oftentimes is the difference between uh, the survival being shorter or longer. And he pointed out in, 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 in his paper that the state of the art in ovarian cancer surgery directly impacts and actually leads to better survival. So I cannot stress that point to you enough. And one of the studies that was cited recently um, showed, this is kind of a, a Kaplan-Meier curve or a survival curve. Um, if a known specific surgeon did, did the surgery and if the diagnosis was stage three ovarian cancer, in terms of survival, you kind of live right here. If an OBGYN operated, you'll survive in this range. But if you sort out a specialist, you'll distinctly do better in terms of survival. And this is not one paper. These are multiple studies. These are out there. Um, a lot of people are aware of these studies. A lot of people are not aware of these studies. And I have nothing against you know, um, a surgeon operating or an uh, OBGYN doctor doing the operation. But when it is ovarian cancer that, the, that we are dealing with, you want to be sure that you seek out help from trained people. If you want to know more about you know, the stories uh, on ovarian cancer survival, this is a great memoir that was written by um, Susan. Um, I, 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 I had a chance to uh, interact with her during one of our um, MOCA sessions um, in, in Minnesota. And so a, a great story, great story of hope. That's another thing is that you never lose hope even when you're diagnosed with ovarian cancer, um, it may be at a later stage, uh, hope is big. And you want to seek out help from your healthcare team where they give you hope and they have the right tools to help you. Another book that uh, comes to mind was written by Dr. John Groupman from Harvard, and it is called uh, The Anatomy of Hope. And it is uh, a moving book which talks about five um, cancer survivors, how they survived against all odds. And I personally like those kind of stories because uh, uh, 
um, they provide a lot of enthusiasm and for a person like me to go on um, to, uh, to treat uh, patients with cancer. Because otherwise it kind of can become very depressing, you know, day in and day out when you're dealing with that illness. But uh, things like that um, are, are very important uh, in terms of um, getting hope and keeping your morale high. At uh, NEA Baptist, in collaboration with uh, Dr. Uh, Chris Bryant, you know, our, our goal is to get you uh, the absolute best that's out there in the care of GYN cancers. There's no doubt about it. And so uh, please give us a chance to serve you. Um, we will provide multidisciplinary care. We'll bring out um, the best quality of care that you need. And uh, this is Dr. Bryant. Um, he couldn't be here, but uh, I'm sure his thoughts are with us. So um, I'll be happy to uh, take any questions. If you have any comments, please feel free to share. Otherwise, um, thank you very much for this opportunity. Um, I want to just say again, my, my uh, purpose of this talk is not to scare anyone that um, uh, ovarian cancer is bad and there's no hope. But I just want to give the message out there that it is a serious illness. And uh, if you have anything that can lead to ovarian cancer or that looks like ovarian cancer or is diagnosed with ovarian cancer, please uh, don't shortchange yourself. Uh, seek the right kind of care. Thank you so much.